Well, today we are uh, concluding our series, Thankful for Blank. I mean, has it been a good series for everybody has been here? Yeah, it's been really good. And here's why. I think it's important for us to just pause from time to time and just, and just think about this, this thing that pretty much every one of us in here, including myself, that we all struggle and, and we have a tendency to cave into our feelings. And, and the problem with our feelings are they're destructive. Our, our feelings are deceitful. Our feelings can lead us down a path that we don't want to go. Our feelings can take us to a place that we don't want to end up. And, and instead, what we're learning is to live in our life off of how we feel. We're trying to learn how to live our life off of truths. See, because truths are true. They're absolutes. They're, they're absolutes in the, in the word of God that cannot be negotiated with. You can try to debate them, but how many you know you're going to lose every time? And truths are stable. Truths truths are the very thing that you can weigh your life against, and the truth will not lead you astray. And today I'm excited to uh, introduce, uh, he's probably one of the better looking pastors on on staff. Uh, Definitely one of the coolest. Josh was like, that's that's, that's debatable, Pastor B. Uh, But I'm telling you, I love this guy so much. I've seen him just grow and mature and mold, and we are so blessed to have him and Pastor uh, Lauren lead our kids, uh, be part of the staff. They love your kids. They battle for your kids. They're there for you, and not only see amazing communicator of the gospel, what, what you don't see, what I get to see is his heart. It's his heart every day to many times put, a, put it to the side, his job, his ministry and stuff to say, Pastor B, how can I serve you? What can I do to take stress off of your plate? And that's rare. That, that's rare you don't find a heart to usually serve in that capacity. So would you guys do me a favor today and give honor where honor is and stand to your feet and welcome to the platform, the one, the only, <laughs> Pastor oh, Jay yes, 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 Jenkins, I knew it was coming. <laughs> it's coming, Jake, Jenkins. Inside joke, sorry. Uh, <laughs> man, I love it. I knew you did it first, sir. I didn't know if you were gonna do it all three, but now I know that the video is gonna be played all three. Uh, those of you who don't know, I was I was at the OU Baylor game when we had the largest comeback in school history, and uh, after taking all that trash talk from Baylor fans of the first half. Me and my buddies, that was the video that I actually share with my youth leaders. So one of my youth leaders in here ratted me out and gave that video to Pastor B to play. It's probably breezy back there. I see you. I see you. (laughs) So anyways, man, I'm excited to be here. Uh, Super excited. You might be looking up here saying, dear God, who is this guy up here with uh, his pants rolled up? Uh, Just so you know, my youth and I are starting a movement and it's called hashtag exposed ankles, right? So uh, I don't know how many of you might might remember, how many of you remember this from like early elementary or junior high, high school days? Like, come on now. I don't, I don't know what you called this. Like, it's debatable. I was talking to some of my friends and I was like, man, I called it the cholo roll growing up, right? And they were like, Jake, that is not a cholo roll. And I was like, oh, okay, right? So just imagine seventh grade Jake Davini at like 115 pounds with like a top button buttoned, the cholo roll on, just like slaying it, man, with my bowl haircut. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> I think it's funny how like trends from the past are like coming back now, right? Like one of our youth kids have actually left, but she finds all of her clothes at thrift stores. And my wife is like, oh my gosh, Jaden, where did you find that? She's like, oh, it's secondhand store. So I don't know, it's crazy how things are coming back, man. So anyways, if you wanna jump on, I had the instructions up there for the cholo roll, hashtag exposed ankles, it's starting, all right? It's a movement, you can't stop it, right? <laughs> anyways, man, I'm so honored to be able to share the word of God with you today. Uh, I'm honored that I would have a pastor that would let me preach with my cholo rose on, right? You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, uh, I feel super honored to be here real quick, but I I asked our first service to do this. I'm gonna ask you to, would you do me a giant favor and stand to your feet and put your hands together for our lead pastors, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Callie, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, keep it going. Keep it going. Let's go. Let's go. Woo. Let's go. Let's go. I love it, man. I, I love my pastor, man. I do. 
And I love it mainly for the heart. Uh, they did this in the first service, him and Callie, and in this service, he's doing it. But uh, that's one of the reasons why I love them is whenever it comes time to honor them, they always deflect it, right? I'm like, man, let's honor our lead pastor. And he's like, Jake, no, stop it, stop it. You guys are cheering, and the whole time he's going, stop, stop, stop. You know, God can use a heart like that, right? God can use a heart that's willing to give and not just receive, Amen. And man, I'm so thankful for him. A lot of you don't know, he's been in my life for a long time. He's helped me through a lot of ups and a lot, a lot of downs, man. So uh, I would not be on this stage right now if it wasn't in part due to Brandon Henry and his life and his wife speaking into my life. So thank you uh, for what you do, man. When I say, Jake, man, why do you give, uh, you know, the Bible talks about honoring those who are over you, right? So Jake, every time you talk, every time Josh talks, every time a speaker talks, why do you talk about honoring the pastor? Because the Bible tells us to. Right, and I'm gonna give honor where honor is due. This is his vision that God gave him for all of us, amen, to run this house, to run the house church. So give it up for Pastor B and Kelly one more time, please. Very nice, let's go ahead and, and uh, say a prayer real quick. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are, Lord. God, I thank you for being here today, Father. I just, I just pray for hearts to be open, for minds to be open, to receive whatever it is that you have for us today. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this building right now, Father. God, we invite you, Holy Spirit, into our hearts and into our minds, and we say, take these words that are spoken and make sure that they're translated through you to reach every situation in this room, Father God. God, we're open, we're willing to receive from you. Thank you for the word that's coming today, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Sweet. Well, let's just kind of recap. Like Pastor B said, I have been tasked with the challenge of actually closing a series uh, and this series has been awesome, y'all. How many of you have been here for all three weeks? A lot of us, man. If not, you need to go back and make sure you rewatch them uh, on our YouTube channel. But man, it was, it's so awesome. In week one, uh, our, our series is called Thankful For. And in week one, Pastor Brandon talked about thankful for truth. All right, thankful for truth. And he shared with us very directly what the truth was. And the truth was this, Jesus loves you. No, and a lot of times the enemy comes in and, and misinterprets or, or can miss changes around those words, you know, but, but some of us need to know that Jesus loves you just as you are. He loves you, right? And, and then he even went on to say that Jesus, who was made righteous, and then us, who are unrighteous, that Jesus became unrighteous so that we could become the righteousness through him, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, that's a God that loves you that cares about you, that would say, listen, I'm gonna step down and take the death penalty for them so that they can have a relationship with my father, amen? I mean, that's the good news, that's the truth. And he started out week one just throwing bombs, y'all. It was good, it was a really good one. Make sure you go back and look at it. Week two, uh, my father-in-law, Johnny Tyler, he actually spoke from the stage. My father-in-law, Johnny Tyler, actually spoke from the stage. <laughs> He's not here this service, so we're good. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> that was not planned, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Uh, my father-in-law, I love him, man. He is a good dude. I respect him tremendously. He might be a little height challenge, but he's, he's a good guy, all right? I'm sorry. I love him. I love him tremendously, but he spoke on being thankful for forgiveness, right? And, and you know, the thing about forgiveness is, is we're really, really good at receiving forgiveness, right? But sometimes we're really, really, it's really, really difficult to give, receive, give forgiveness, Right? The Bible says that Jesus Christ himself came not to be served by the world, but to serve the world. Yeah. Right? And as Christians, I believe that, that even though we receive the forgiveness of God, we should also take that forgiveness and just extend it to everybody else around us. Amen? Yeah. Amen? You see, he did a great job talking about forgiveness. Make sure you look that up. Week three, that was last week, Josh Herring. Pastor Josh, he brought the word, man. Woo. Let's go. It's been awesome to watch him grow, Pastor B, and just watch him bring the word. But uh, last week, he talked about being thankful for grace, right? Thankful for grace. And, and he talked about how grace is not is a term that as Christians, we kind of get it confused with forgiveness. No, you say, hey, show grace, man. And you think, oh, that means show forgiveness. You see, but, but what grace is, is it's actually walking out the life that God has for you, right? He, 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 he talked about the story of Rahab and how Rahab started out as a prostitute. Right? But by the end of her life, she was known as the mother of kings. Right? Because she walked in the grace of God to change her story and change her life. Amen? 
Man, you see, grace is a good thing. We all should be walking in grace as we get to where Jesus has called us to be, all right? You see, this whole series has been based around what I'm gonna talk about today, okay? It, it, the, the word that I'm gonna share with you today is kind of the summary of all three of these things, all right? And, and what I'm gonna talk about today is I am thankful for vision. I'm thankful for vision, You see, this whole series is about the vision that God has for our lives. You see, starting with, do you know the truth? Do you know what the Bible says Jesus did for you and what God has for you? See, and then then the second week, it talked about forgiveness. Do we accept forgiveness and do we give forgiveness? And then thirdly, do we walk our lives out in grace? Because you know what? That's the vision that God has for your life, amen? Now, I don't want you to confuse the word vision with the word purpose, Okay, a lot of times people confuse that. My, my wife, whenever I told her I was speaking on vision, she was like, ugh. I was like, what? She was like, that's a, like a Christian term, like fellowship, right? <laughs> like, what's your vision, right? It's like, do I have to have a dream? Like, no, all right? But, but there's a difference between vision and purpose, all right? Vision and purpose. You see, purpose is where we're ending up, right? And vision is how we get there. Does that make sense? Easy enough. Hey, do you have that football? Thank you, sir. Ooh, look at that toss. Give it up for Mike. Let's go. Let's go. He even had like the whole like underhand like ref toss. You know what I mean? But that kind of looked like I was bowling. I don't know what that was. All right. (laughs) Hey, it's football season, right? I love football season. I went to a small school. Uh, I I lettered in five different sports just because I love competing. Uh, It's football was one of my favorite games to play. It was one of my favorite ways. Uh, to compete, right? I, I remember this was a long time ago. Uh, my coach had actually put in a new passing route at the time that we called the rub route, okay? The rub route. Does anyone in here know what that is? Any of my coaches in here? Good, I'll tell you, all right? No big deal, all right? Uh, basically, uh, what my coach wanted us to do was we would set up in twins, and the inside receiver would set, set up a four-step out, and then the outside receiver would work on a three-step slant. Okay, and the idea behind this was as you're running your out and as you're running your slant, that you would actually rub shoulders together and hopefully your defender would get lost in the chaos and one of you would come open. Does that make sense? Right, so, so I remember playing uh, Elmore City, right? Any Elmore City Badgers in here? I still love you, all right, it's all good. All right, I was from Maysville, I was a Maysville warrior. So, uh, wow, none of them in here, okay. Wow, we're outnumbered. Thank you, thank you, the wave, the finger point. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so it was probably first quarter, second quarter, I'm really not sure, but I remember my coach, Coach Osteen, calling an audible, and, uh, and we go to run this play, and I'm excited, I'm like, sweet, 50-50 chance I'll get open and get the ball, right? So I take off, I run my route, I take off on the outside, I rub shoulders with the slant, and I find myself open. Right, so I do what I'm coached to do. I turn up the field and I start sprinting down the field. Now imagine like 119 pound, like Jake Davini sprinting down the field as fast as he could, okay? I was that guy that I played a lot bigger than I was. It's probably why I got a lot of concussions, but uh, it is what it is. So I'm like running up the side of the field. My best friend, Michael Wynn is the quarterback. He steps back, he sees me, he throws the ball and the ball's coming down and I'm thinking, okay, what all of my coaches taught me? Keep your fingertips together, keep your eyes on the ball, watch it all the way into your hands, we're good to go. So the ball's coming down and right before it gets to my hands, I lose the ball in the light, right? How many of you have ever baseball players, softball, football, you look up and you're like, ah, blinded by the light, right? As it's coming down, it hits my fingertips, it topples off and I'm just like, no. I dive after it, I hit, my, my face mask is on the ground, I start skidding across the side, and I'm just laying there thinking, dear God, do I get up right now or do I not? It's just like quiet in, in the whole place. So it, it, anyways, I get up, we go back to the line, and uh, sorry, Elmore, we did end up beating you uh, that year, but uh, it's all good, right? But as I was kind of preparing for the message today, uh, you know, this story came to my mind. You know, and the story, the purpose behind this story was this. You see, I I had my enemy defeated, right? I was on my way to my purpose. I was on my way to my goal. But in a last ditch effort, the last thing that stopped me from completing what I needed to do was my vision was taken for just a split moment, amen? For just a split moment, my vision was gone. 
So I had a youth pastor who told me once that what the enemy can't destroy, the enemy will distract. Okay, someone needs to write that down. What the enemy can't destroy, the enemy will distract. See, and I'm here to tell you that you're running your race a little bit better than you think you are. You see, that you have the enemy on, it, on, on the ropes, that he's behind you, that, that you've come out of the route ready to succeed. You're running towards the end zone. You're almost there. And in a last ditch effort, the enemy says, I want to take your vision. I want to take your path. I want to take your way so you never receive your purpose. You see, what's your purpose today? What's your purpose today? In Proverbs Mm-hmm. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Mm. Where there is no vision, the people perish. They perish. Now, I looked up the Hebrew word for perish and what it meant in context there, and it comes from the root word para, which means to live without restraint. Okay, it actually uh, referred to a woman's hair would, would be bound and then they would let it loose and it would blow wildly in the wind. See, so what this verse is saying is that where there is no vision, the people live wildly. The people live in chaos. The people live without order. Can I tell you, God has a vision for your life and it's to bring order to your situation, amen? It's to bring order. See, we're gonna talk today about vision and what that vision is. I think there are three types of people in this room today, including myself. Three types of people. I think there's, there's one type of person here that maybe you're trying to find the vision for your life. Okay, you're trying to find the vision for your life. I think there might be a second type of person in here where, where maybe you found the vision for your life, but now you're called to protect that vision because the enemy wants to take it from you. Then I think there's a third type of person in here where, where maybe you're, you're, you need to regain your vision. You found it at one point, but you find yourself with your helmet on the ground, skidding across the floor saying, God, I've lost my vision. Well, today he's saying, will you get up and regain your vision today, amen? Yeah. See, let me bring a word of hope. God has prepared a way to your purpose, and it's your vision. You have to find it, you have to protect it, you have to regain it, sometimes over and over and over again, but don't give up. The road can be hard, but God has a way, amen? He has a way. When I think of uh, someone in the Bible who lost his vision, this is probably the most common story uh, of someone. I love to read stories. Just say, Holy Spirit, what do you have for me? What do you have for us in this story today? and then speak from that. You could go home and read this story and God could speak to you directly about something else in your life. And he could pull something else out of this scripture. The Bible says that his word is a living, breathing document. We're gonna read a, a story, the story of Saul. You see, now Jesus has already uh, risen from the dead. He had already gone uh, to be with the Father. The Great Commission had already been sent to the disciples to go making disciples and baptize unbelievers, right? And then there's this man named Saul this man named Saul, who, who just did not believe that Jesus Christ was the truth, right? So we come into the story when Saul decides that he's gonna do something about it, okay? Chapter nine, verse one of Acts. Acts chapter nine, verse one. It says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone belonging to the way. Look at somebody and say the way. Yeah. Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, I think it's awesome that the words that he used here was the way, right? You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. Can I speak some truth? Do you know that even the enemy knows that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him? See, it crazy how, how the enemy tries to attack the way in our life. The way in our life. See, in verse three, it says, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city. You will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw what? What did he see? He saw nothing. Saw nothing. So they led him, they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight in the house of Judas. Look for this man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. He is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him. See then verse 17, until the healing, Ananias actually starts to throw up excuses to God. He starts to throw up reasons why he shouldn't go see Saul. This is Saul, God. He's the Saul that wants to persecute us. He's the Saul that wants to put us in chains and throw us in jail. You want me to go there? How many of us, you might have a purpose. You might have a call. You might have a ministry on your life. But instead of reaching out and going for it, you say, God, you want me? You want me to help in children's, to help in youth, to help serve? You want me? Verse 17 said, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Amen? Amen? God, I love reading the the Bible. I love reading stories in the Bible. See, I think the first thing that that the Holy Spirit kind of dropped in my spirit whenever we were reading through this was the first thing you have to do is you must be willing to be led. (sighs) Jake, I'm a leader. You must be willing to be led led. But Jake, I'm a a youth pastor. You must be willing to be led. You must be willing to be led. Verse six, it says, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. You see, you have to understand who we're dealing with here. This is Paul, Saul. He hasn't turned into Paul yet. This is Saul, all right, and Saul was the man who said, you know what? I don't like this Jesus movement that's happening. So I'm gonna go to the Pharisees. I'm gonna tell them I need warrants. I'm gonna go arrest these people and I'm gonna put a stop to it. That doesn't sound like someone who's a follower to me. That sounds like someone who's a leader, right? Who's a leader, but it still said he had to be led by the hand. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to be led by another vision? Mm. Are you willing to be led by the vision of a pastor? Are you willing to be led by the vision of a church? See, now don't get that mixed up with with, with purpose because the purpose is to bring people to know Christ, right? But the vision is the method in which we bring people to, to Christ, right? The whole reason I'm here at this church, I feel like God has planted me, is to serve the vision of a house, right? The, the vision of this house, believe, belong, become, and be the church. That's our vision to bring people to know him, right? We believe that we're called to bring unbelievers to believe, okay? We believe that this place needs to be a place where everyone can belong, right? Through all my junk that I deal with, I can still walk in those doors and Pastor B is gonna give me a big hug. I have men in this building that are going to check up on me and see how I'm doing. There are men who, when I feel like I need to be checked up on, I can call them right? I can belong, right? Believe, belong, become. See, it's not just a place for us to come attend church, but it's a place for us to listen to the word of God on Sundays and in family groups and take our growth track and learn and become what God has called us to be, right? And then finally, the vision is to be the church. Josh and I were talking about this. We were, we were putting our year-long calendar together with the pastors, and uh, we were looking at everything we have to do next year, and I was like, dear God, we're a busy church, right? But I love it because that's the fourth part of our vision. 
is we're called to be the church, not just within these four walls, but the church is giving us every opportunity we can to be the church outside of these four walls, amen? To reach our communities, to reach our families, to reach our kids, to reach our schools, to be the church, right? That's the vision of the house, not the purpose. The purpose of the house is to bring people to know Christ. And we do that through our vision. So my question to you is this, what is your vision that you're looking for? Can I tell you, it's not your place to run your house. Mm. Can I tell you, it's the place of the word of God to run your house. Can I tell you, it's not your place to raise your kids. Can I tell you, the word of God has called you to raise your kids, right? The word of God has a vision for your life to complete the purpose of your life. Right, so when, when you feel like, man, I don't know what to do with that snotty nose kid that just gives me attitude all the time, open up the word. There's a vision in there, right? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to leave my wife. There's a vision in the Bible. It tells you. I don't know how to be a good wife to my husband. There's a vision in the Bible. I don't know how to act with my boss. There's a vision in the Bible. See, so, so what is the vision that you need Today, what is the vision behind your purpose? Philippians 2, verse 3, out of the ESV, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. If you need step one, step one for my vision, step one for the vision of my kids, for the vision of my wife, for the vision of, of whoever or whatever, my job, it says, do nothing from selfish ambition. That doesn't sound like the world I live in. It doesn't sound anything like the world I live in, but the world that I live in wants to take my vision, amen? It wants to take my vision so I can't complete the purpose. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I'm here to encourage you today. Find your vision Whatever that vision is, protect your vision. And dear God, if you find yourself face down on the grass, regain your vision. Regain your vision. God has called you to a purpose. You're much too, too needed in his kingdom. Regain your vision. Point number two. Number one, he was willing to be led. Point number two, get focused. Get focused. Verse nine, it says that for three days, he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Do me a favor. I need everyone in here. Just, just close your eyes for me. Everyone just close your eyes. For three days, in a moment's time, this is all that Saul saw. <laughs> This is all that he saw. He saw nothing. He might've seen some fleeting shadows kind of go by, some bright light, some not so bright light fly by. You see, but he was in a tough situation. See, and I can't help but think if he was seeing what you're seeing right now for one whole day, he'd be like, God, where are you at? God, where are you? If he saw what you were seeing right now for two whole days, he'd be like, God, are you even real? Do you really have a plan for my life? Do you really want me to lead my family? Do you really want me to lead my kids? You know, day three, I, I can't help but think that he, was, he had this overwhelming doubt in his mind of God, are you going to show up? See, look at me. His day three was coming. It was coming. See, but what did he do in that meantime? It says he was praying. See, it says he was seeking God in his time of need. See, there's a lot of things that pull at us in our time of need. There are a lot of things we would much rather do in our time of need than get on our knees and pray to God and open his word and seek the wisdom of a leader. But he's saying, will you seek me in your time of need? I can't promise you that you become a Christian and life is good. Can anyone testify to that? Now, my heart is good. And I walk through life knowing I'm good, but that doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. 
See, the enemy is constantly attacking, constantly trying to steal your vision. But the best way to combat against that is to get on our knees, seek God, seek what his word has to say, then do it. Then do it, right? Number one, are you willing to be led? Are you willing to be led? Number two, we gotta get focused. I'm here to encourage you. We need to find our vision. We need to guard our vision. Please regain your vision if it's lost. Point number three. Ben, you guys can go ahead and come up. That means I'm almost done for everyone, so, <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> One time I was speaking at FCA and I only had two points instead of three. And I was, looked at another pastor who was there. I was like, am I still a pastor? I don't know. You have to have three, three points. <laughs> Here's point three. If you're taking notes, write this down. God has you. Let's just, just listen to those words. God has you. God has you. He has you. See, in verse nine, it said for three days, he was without sight. And then it goes to verse 11. And it said, he was praying and he received his vision. And then Ananias came in and healed him. God healed him through Ananias. Right, so verse nine, he was without sight. Verse 11, he was praying and received his vision. But what happened right there in verse 10? What was it that was happening in verse 10? In verse 10, it says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, rise and go to the street called Straight and the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Did you know that right in the middle of your situation, God already has your Ananias coming. He's already working on your behalf. He's already creating and working and molding and shaping doors to open and doors to close for you. He has a vision for you because there's a purpose for you. He has a vision for you because there's a purpose for you. See, are we willing to be led? Are we willing that when times get hard that we get on our knees and say, God, help me. We seek the, the, the wise counsel. And are we willing to trust and have faith that God has you? See, now, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, as a matter of fact, it's about 14 scriptures that explains this phrase I'm about to say. It says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Like I said, you can go look it up. There's like 14 scriptures that go into a lot more detail than I'm gonna go into. See, but a lot of times I, I can sit on my knees and I say, God, help me, I'm hungry. But until I put some action behind it, my faith is dead. Can I speak truth? Look it up. I, I say, God, my friend is going through a rough time. He really needs to spend some time with, with some godly people because he's struggling, man. God help him. Faith without works is dead. Is it possible that maybe God's calling you to do something, but you don't have the faith behind it, so your faith without the works is dead? It's dead. So I'm here to challenge you. I'm here to challenge you. You have faith to lead your wife. You have faith to lead your husband. You have faith to lead your kids. You have faith to be a leader in your workplace. You have faith to do all these things. But what are you putting behind it? Are you on your knees seeking God and saying, I will follow your word? Because faith without works is dead. If you will, go ahead and stand with me real quick. good news is this. You might feel like you're in the middle of your day one. You might feel like you're in the middle of your day two. You might feel like you're in the middle of your day three. But with faith, all things are possible. With faith, our God is going to show up, right? And your Ananias will come. See, but are you willing to be led? Are you willing to seek what God has for you? And are you willing, are you willing to have faith, to know that God is working on your behalf. See, this whole series, this whole series talks about the vision that God has for your life. 
And his vision was this, to speak truth into you, to send someone who was truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. That's truth. And, th- and then week two, we talked about forgiveness. I, I know you know the truth, but-, but you follow the truth because God forgave you and now he's calling you to forgive others. He's calling you to forgive them. And then week three, he said, you know the truth. You accept my forgiveness, but, but are you willing to walk out grace? I know you're gonna stumble. I know you're gonna fall, but are you willing to walk out grace so you can go from Rahab, the prostitute, to Rahab, the mother of kings? And today I'm just a messenger to say, this is God's vision for your life, for your life. Truth, forgiveness, grace. Have you lost your vision? Are you searching for a vision? Are you trying to protect your vision? If you will, bow your head and close your eyes with me real quick. I believe that God loves us so much that he's decided to refocus us. He's decided to refocus me this morning to say, Jake, what's your vision? Are you willing to be led? Are you willing to work on your focus? And do you trust that I'm working on your behalf? In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, they para. But he that keeps the law happy is he. Another version says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Remember, that's what para meant. But happy is he who keeps the law. Now check out this last version. It says, where there is no revelation, I can give you information all day, but until you get the revelation that God has a vision for your life, it will go nowhere. What's your revelation today? People cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom. Who heeds wisdom. See, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. You say, Jake, man, I need this vision in my life. I need this path in my life. I need to say, I'm going to start following the vision of God, which is the way of Jesus. I'm going to open my Bible and I need to create this relationship with the word and walk it out. Jake, I need it. I need him to be my Lord. I need him to be my savior. The Bible says, if you confess and believe, you will be saved. This will be quick, but I want to give everyone an opportunity. Say, Jake, I need this vision. I need it in my life. If I need to pray with you, I need to lead you in this prayer. All of us will pray. Just raise your hand so I know, so I can pray this prayer with you. Amen. Amen. I see your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. Amen. And yours. Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to help you with the confessing part. We're all going to help you with the, you do the believing part. Okay, if we'll all pray this together. Say, God, thank you for having a vision for my life. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross so I can have a relationship with you. Please forgive me. Help me walk out your vision for my life as you spelled it out in your word. Thank you, Father, for drawing me to you. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, give it up real quick. Let's go. Let's go. Woo! Vision is being restored. I don't ever want to leave without a ministry opportunity. You see, that, that's vision for your life, right? God is my Lord. Jesus died for me, and I'm going to follow his word. See, but there's a lot of things that we deal with as Christians, right? Jobs, a spouse, right? The next generation, right? Family, all sorts of stuff that we deal with. Addiction, anxiety, depression. We deal with it. Can we just say that? See, but I know that the Bible has a vision for how to handle all of it. How to handle all of it. Prayer team, if you'll go ahead and come down front for me real quick. You see, the prayer team that's coming up right now, they're not gonna pray their thoughts over your life. They're gonna share the vision of the Bible in your situation. 
Does that make sense? They're going to share what the Bible says about what you are going through. What the Bible says to do where you're at right now. See, so, so this is what I want you to do. Ask yourself, what do I need vision for? We're going to go into a worship song. Okay, and during this worship song, just worship God. Just thank God. Just praise God for who He is. But seek God's vision. The Bible says where two or more are gathered. Two or more are gathered. There He is. There He is. See, I believe that, that you have partners up here with you that are going to gather with you and pray God's vision over your situation. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your vision today. I just pray for your Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. Father God, I thank you for words that are going to be spoken into our situation right now. God, that you will speak and make yourself real. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Find somebody to speak vision. Thank God for vision, amen.